I'm going to tell you a few stories today. Here's the first. Over the holidays, I had the joy of dragging my three boys, my husband Reza and my twin two-year-old Cyrus and Jasper, out of the sunshine in Los Angeles across the country to the cold of um, my hometown, a suburb just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we were there to spend holidays with our, my family, um, specifically with uh, my mom and dad. As soon as we walk in the door, Mimi and Grandy scoop them up and cover them with hugs and kisses and love. And we, my husband and I, love to kind of facilitate this process and to help the boys sort of show off <laughs> with all the new things that they've learned or can do or have discovered since the last time they've seen their beloved Mimi and Grandy. Even though they look tough. I mean, I love grandma, right? They <laughs> they're fans. <laughs> this last time around, one of the more fun and quite frankly, I think pretty awesome little tricks that my boys can do that we showed off right away to the grandparents is this game that we have very not creatively called the opposites game. Now, you're wondering what this amazing game is. Well, basically one of the adults says, hey Cyrus and Jasper, what's the opposite of up? And of course, I mean, they just turn two. This is like super fun. They scramble to, you know, beat each other and say the answer, down. And then they can't quite say all the words correctly. So they'll say, down, up and down are opposites. <laughs> so this opposites game has become like the thing that we did over Christmas break. <laughs> and we, you know, we rattle through all the usual ones, up, down, hot, cold, right, left. Now this was such a hit that on one of the, one of the long drives through the snow to, um, I think it was to the Christmas Eve service at church, my mom, Mimi, initiates the opposites game. We're trying you know, to figure out what to ask them next, and my mom says, oh, I got one. Hey, boys, what's the opposite of walk? Now, we're in the front seat, the boys are in the back, and I kind of look over at my mom like, that is so hard, that was not the greatest call. Like, I don't, what are they gonna do with this? And I'm, my mind's going like, okay, they're probably gonna give two different answers, and then we have to debate the rightness of each answer. Like, this could get really bad. So as I'm like freaking out unnecessarily, um, all of a sudden, just a few seconds later, I hear this little voice squeak from the back, can't we? And it, I didn't hear it at first, but then, I don't know if it was Sarah or Jasper, but the other one joined in, and then they're both saying, yeah, can't we? Can't we? <laughs> and of course they meant carry. Now, I felt these two words sort of in my head find themselves in they did so in, in a sentence that I say to my boys several times a day, something to the effect of, you know, do you, can you walk or do you need mama to carry you? Um, <laughs> in their world, the opposite of walk is to be carried. So that's my first story and we're gonna come back to it. My second story um, takes place in East Africa and this is actually a picture of me in 2004 five years after my first visit to East Africa, and that was in 1999 through Semester at Sea. And as you know, so many of us in this room know, that first visit changes everything. I mean, it had wet my appetite and just really lit a fire in me to come back to all the places I had visited, but in particular, I really wanted to get back to East Africa. So five years later, it took me a little while, but I finally did, and this was during um, a project, about a three and a half, four month um, project that I did with Village Enterprise Fund, a small nonprofit that provided $100 grants to, you know, to, to entrepreneurs to either start or to grow their tiny, their tiny enterprises. This was a magical time for me, and throughout it, I met so many amazing people. Um, and one of those people, one of the individuals that has stuck with me and who I feel really embodies the spirit of so many of the others that I met is a gentleman named Patrick. Um, when I met him on this blazing hot afternoon in Uganda in the spring of 2004, I, I heard Patrick's story. As a boy, he told me, he had fled his, his village um, when a rebel group had attacked, had attacked where they lived, attacked their community. He fled just with his brother. He left everyone else and everything else behind, and he ended up in, a, in an area near Mbale, Uganda, with really nothing, no home, no food, no clothes except those on his back, not even shoes on his feet. So Patrick and his brother um, ended up there, and if you looked at their situation, I mean, they were young, orphaned, uh, hungry, homeless, uneducated, and to most people, pretty hopeless, right? But then one day, everything changed, or more accurately, Patrick chose to make everything change. It happened one morning as he was sitting watching the sun come up. Yeah, he had his back against the mud structure that he called home, and 
he was thinking, as he did every morning, kind of racking his brain about how he was going to feed himself and his younger brother that day. And the same old ideas, the same old solutions came to mind, which had somewhat been working over the previous years. But as he was thinking and sort of staring off in the distance, his, his hand was resting on the ground next to him. And he sort of looked back at his hand, sort of stared at it. And then he, he, he felt this twinge <laughs> in his chest, the awakening of a new idea, of an epiphany. And as he looked at his hand resting on the ground, he started to dig in with his fingers. And you just feel it, right? And as he dug, he dug some more. He got some, you know, a, a branch nearby and then this old scrap of discarded metal. And he dug and dug until he found the more rusty colored patches of earth right below the surface, the clay. And he started to experiment with that clay. He started to mix it with a little bit of water to see what would happen, to see if he could make it into something that could be shaped. And of course he could. So he began to shape that clay into bricks. At first, his bricks were really rough. They crumbled easily. Um, they were kind of misshapen. <laughs> but he got better at it quite quickly. And soon enough, he was able to sell some of these bricks for a very tiny bit of money. I mean, the equivalent of a fraction of a penny each. But he did that again and again and again. And soon, he had enough money to buy this wooden brick mold. When he did that, the bricks that he could make, you know, he made them more rapidly, of course, and they were more uniform and evenly shaped. They held together a little bit better, and they sold for a little bit more. At first, he dried his bricks in the sun, but he knew that kiln-fired bricks would sell for even a little bit more. So his next goal, to buy some matches and learn how to build a self-contained kiln, which he did. As he continued along in this process, um, he bought those matches, he built the kiln, he sold those bricks for even a little bit more. And of course, over time, you can imagine he was able to afford charcoal instead of just wood for that kiln a shovel, a trowel, and all the materials that he needed to continue to grow his business. Soon, he had enough revenue to be able to hire his younger brother, then a neighbor, then another. So years later when I met him, as he told me the story, <laughs> I mean, I was and I am so inspired by it because starting with virtually nothing, almost nothing, Patrick was able, by literally pulling from the earth <laughs> these bricks, to build a business that allowed him to have sustainable livelihood and that supported several others as well. So those are my two main stories for you today. Now, let's go back to the first one for a minute. Walk or carry. <laughs> these are two opposites to my kids. And I'm, I agree with them. The more I've thought about it, the more I agree. They are these opposing forces. In fact, they have been two opposing forces that have led to some somewhat dramatic and embarrassing and frustrating public debates between myself and my kids. Now, don't get me wrong. I love nothing more than holding my babies. And when they were super tiny, it was easier than it is now. They've gotten heavier. The logistics are a little more complicated. We get the weirdest like pat downs from TSA in the airport. Um, anyway, but I do it whenever I can because I love it. I'd, I'd carry them all the time if I could, but I can't. Especially when you know you you know the picture. You, you have this. Uh, I have this picture in my head daily. I have the groceries in one arm and my computer bag slung over the other, and you know the mail. I'm picking up the mail, and I have the keys to the front door, and then there are these random stray toys that I'm picking up along the way. Sometimes it's just impossible to carry my boys. <laughs> now, when this is the case, and I explain to them gently that they need to walk instead, usually it's not a problem, but sometimes it is, and they put up a little bit of a fight. And sometimes it's cute. I mean, they might beg or cry or use their words, which is even heartbreakingly you know, worse, because they'll, they'll say, they'll express their feelings. They're really emotive, and they, they'll say, Mama, I want you to carry me. I'm crying. I have tears. <laughs> like, it's really hard to say no to that, but... Sometimes it's not so cute, um, and they will throw a fit. And wherever they are, they'll start yelling or crying very loudly and sit themselves down or even lie down just wherever we are. Now, this has happened frequently at the bottom of the steps up to our house, but they stop right where they are because they're mad. They're frustrated. They believe that they haven't been helped enough, right? They haven't gotten something they want that they feel they need, that they feel they deserve, um, so they stop. They stop moving forward. Now, but this kind of reaction, unfortunately, is not just exclusive to toddlers. We, and I will admit I have done this too, we adults sometimes stop where we are when we get frustrated because we haven't gotten something we want and towards a goal we're pursuing. We haven't gotten something we need or that we even feel we deserve. So we get angry and pouty and stop. <laughs> and I've seen this happen again and again. With friends of mine, colleagues of mine, um, aspiring entrepreneurs, they get stuck. Or more accurately, they choose to stop, they choose to get stuck. And then there are those of us, there are others, who refuse to get stuck, people like Patrick, despite not getting a lot of things that many of us would think everyone deserves. What's the difference? I think 
through my work, through the thousands of entrepreneurs I've been able to meet all around the world, um, I think the common thread is that those individuals that don't get stuck are living and thinking and working and just doing life entrepreneurially. What does this mean? Well, there are a lot of definitions of entrepreneurship, a lot of ones that I like a lot, but I've, I've chosen this one today specifically because it emphasizes what I think is the real key. This definition is from Howard Stevenson. And about 40 years ago, he said that entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. Kind of academic, but just the, the, the key words to focus on in here, I believe, are the pursuit, right? It's about forward movement. It's, the emphasis here is on action, not on the resources. And it's a particular kind of pursuit. It's a pursuit toward opportunity, toward possibility and potential in the world. Again, without regard to resources, without the things we assume will help carry us along in the process. So entrepreneurship is not at its heart about what we have, it's about what we do and what we choose to build. Now, a quick caveat here. Um, I'm a big fan of providing resources to entrepreneurs. Uh, the last decade of my work has been focused on this through helping to co-found Kiva and ProFounder and through my work investing and advising at the Collaborative Fund. I mean, I love this stuff, right? This is what I do, providing, empowering entrepreneurs, providing them resources that they need to succeed or that they that helps them succeed a little bit more, um, surrounding them with supportive communities, removing barriers in their way. I love this stuff. This is my work. But that said, um, my work has also shown me that rarely is it the case that access to a particular resource in the long term determines an entrepreneur's success or failure. And yet we obsess over these things. We obsess over, over what we have or what we don't have. I love hearing people's stories. Um, it's my thing. So, and I hear lots of stories of aspiring entrepreneurs or people that have these glimpses of more for more potential or greater things in their lives but they've gotten stuck, they've chosen to stop. And this litany of reasons um, come tumbling out of their mouths. Often people know and they'll, they'll jump to, to tell me this. Um, they'll say, well, you know, I had this idea, but I just, I didn't think I had the funding. I didn't know where to get that. Or, well, I mean, you have to know the right people and I just, I don't have a really big network. My background is in a totally different thing, so I didn't think I was qualified enough. I didn't have the right expertise. Again and again, people tell me they can't pursue what they want to because they don't have something that they need. And the list is sadly kind of endless. Um, you know, if they do have the funding, well, then I don't have the right education. If they do have the, the education, I don't have enough experience. Or I live in the wrong city, or I'm not charismatic enough. Whatever it is, the list can go on and on and on. And the thing is, if you listen closely enough, what's saddest to me is not so much that these people are saying, oh, I don't have this thing. I feel like what they mean and what they believe, but maybe it's hard to admit, is that they don't believe that they have externally or internally what it takes. Um, but I, I think they're incorrect. <laughs> I think they're wrong. Resources currently controlled, this is not what matters to great entrepreneurs, to successful entrepreneurs. It's about moving forward, period. Yeah, some things do help us move forward um, more than others, but often they're not the things that we think. They're not the things that the world tells us that we need. They're, I believe, somewhat unexpected and often intangible and visible things, but they're things that we can all access or create or build when we need to. So, for example, having a strong sense of purpose, knowing why you're doing the work that you do and being motivated by that in the long run will always win over a temporary business advantage access to things that you need, being able to, to, to get to what you need in the moment, not, not just raising a bunch of money and owning everything you might possibly need one day, that's more important than that ownership. And a lot of my work uh, with the Collaborative Fund, really championing collaborative consumption in the sharing economy is all about this trend, in fact, toward a world that prioritizes access over ownership and, and um, celebrates that. Authenticity, being true to yourself, matters more than the approval of others along the way. Resilience trumps getting it right on the first or even the second or third try. In community, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a crowdfunding person, apparently. Uh, community matters more than the crowd. When you really need it, having even a, a small group of people around you who support you and love you and believe in you is gonna matter more than getting a lot of eyeballs on your, on your you know, fundraising site. So great entrepreneurs, the greatest entrepreneurs that I know understand these things. Um, they count what really matters in moving forward. And they know that even when it might not look on the outside like they have a lot of resources around them, they know that they have enough of the right things to make progress.
these are all Kiva entrepreneurs I'm about to show you. They see the world as a place of abundance and opportunity and potential, even in the ground beneath their feet. And they see potential, most importantly, in themselves. They believe that they are capable and worthy and strong. And these beliefs fuel a conviction and a strength to be able to act, to move ahead day after day, regardless of what resources or lack thereof are around them. We live in a world that can tell us, in so many words, that we are never ready, that we always need just one more thing before we really take those big, bold steps forward, that you know we need to learn or earn or achieve something else before we take those big leaps. But the opposite is true. When we simply take even small steps forward, with each step we find and we affirm our own strength and our own readiness, our own worthiness, and we become our best selves, we become great entrepreneurs, starting from zero, <laughs> just taking those small steps. And that's what the greatest among us know. Um, they succeed not because of what they have, because of what they choose to do and what they choose to build. And as they do, the world actually rises up to meet them. And as, as they do, the resources that we all covet, we all think we need, actually find them. And they're, they're drawn to those individuals. And whether or not you consider yourself an entrepreneur, we can all live this way. We can all live entrepreneurially. We can surge ahead despite the reasons we feel like we can't, the things that we don't have. We can see the world the way Patrick did, full, I mean, brimming with opportunity all around us. And we don't have to dwell on the things that we don't have or the things that we lack or that we have lost. Instead, we can just build. And we can realize potential in everything around us and every person around us and in ourselves. We all want to be helped along sometimes to find people or things to help carry us. And that's wonderful. I have dedicated my career to trying to provide some of those things. But there are moments when it's just us and we have to get up and stand on our own and walk forward. And we're able to do that. We're capable of doing that. I strive to live an entrepreneurial life, to see a world full of possibility and opportunity and adventure, and to choose to take advantage of those things, to pursue those things. This is what I hope most for each person in this room, that you can see those opportunities as well and feel this optimism and, and hope that I know I feel. And this is what I hope most for my little ones as well, that even when it's difficult, <laughs> even when it's, it's hard for them, that they can choose, so to speak, to, to walk forward, to stand up, and to do what they're capable of doing and to fulfill their own potential, to move forward toward their dreams. Thank you.